Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's Talent Talk, which is on candidate experience. I am delighted to be joined by three very senior and experienced figures from the talent acquisition and recruitment industry. Uh, all three of them need little, if any, introduction. Uh, joining us from New York, Jerry Crispin, uh, principal and co-founder of Career uh, Crossroads and a, a legend by all accounts in, in the industry. And Noel Brown, um, Global Talent Acquisition Leader at Thermo, Thermo Fisher Scientific. And John Stanners, who's Head of Global Talent Engagement at Telefonica Alpha, two of the rising stars within the industry. Um, now, before we go on to just, I'm gonna summarize quickly what, um, what uh, the three speakers are gonna talk about. The first thing I'd like everybody to do is to go to Slido. So if you could bring up a browser, open a browser window, go to Google and type in Slido, okay? And then click to follow that. Uh, this, it should take you to this screen here. Now, uh, enter W056 as the code to join uh, this event. And this is where we're gonna handle all of the questions and answers. So when you have questions, just post them in here, you know, as we're going through the webinar, and then we can answer them uh, with a panel at the end. And uh, we've got a couple of polls which we're gonna run. So go to Slido, enter the code W056, hit join, and keep that browser window open, please, for when the polls come up. And uh, add you can add questions there as we're going through. So first, uh, I'd like to go to Jerry. Jerry's gonna, Jerry's gonna talk to us about um, the current evidence on the five practices that influence how candidates rate their treatment during the hiring process. Noel is going to follow Jerry and he's going to talk about the consumerization of the candidate, what job seekers want in an employer and how that impacts the business. He's going to share a, a candidate experience checklist and a roadmap to get there and he's going to share what they measure at Thermo Fisher Scientific. John is going to close off some of the open loops that are that are opened in those conversations. Um, he's going to look at candidate experience in the attraction phase, uh, and this will all be based on his experience at Telefonica, Alpha, and previous positions. So, Jerry, without further ado, over to you. Good, thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you great. Fabulous. Listen, um, I really appreciate it. I think it's an honor to be able to uh, have a conversation with you and, and others in this space. I'm just very passionate about the subject and have been for more years than most people uh, have been alive. So uh, it's a lot of fun for me. And, you know, I, I have been um, concerned about the issue for many years because we failed miserably to uh, measure what we're talking about. And it's only been in the last few years that we've gotten uh, much better at that subject. So when I make a statement like 80% of your candidate's experience and essentially the rating they will give you is really can be bucketed into five different practices, um, I'm not saying that without a good deal of evidence behind it. And so I just want to take a minute to share where that's coming from. Seven years ago, uh, several of us in the space uh, put together a nonprofit, uh, which is a nice way of saying none of us make money out of it, um, <clears throat> to, to collect um, and share uh, the data around what a candidate experience actually is, from the practices of the companies uh, to, the, uh, to the performance of those companies as well. And on that journey over the last seven years, we now have more than, I guess, about six, 700 different companies that have participated. Many participate every year. Um, and, and nearly a million of their candidates now who've completed comprehensive surveys, as many as 60 questions response, uh, in, in response to their journey from the point at which they become aware of the company <clears throat> to the point at which they're uh, onboarding. And that's a, that's a pretty huge amount of data that we've been collecting over time and, and we've been refining it and year over year we've been looking at those issues. Uh, we now have uh, some teams of PhDs looking at it from academic point of view. 
Um, and what we're finding is that there are some basic uh, practices that correlate most highly with how the candidate rates you. There's obviously a lot of other things that are critical to that issue. So that's kind of what I want to address in a few minutes. And then, you know, hopefully it helps to tee up uh, pieces of that conversation that we can have throughout the hour. Um, I'm also, I would also make a point right from the beginning that one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Steve Jobs. Um, who is very much obviously focused on the customer experience. And he made a comment uh, years ago, it uh, says, you've got to start with the customer experience and work backward to the technology, not the other way around. And I make that uh, as a very strong statement when I talk to uh, technology leaders out there because it is the technology that empowers the practice, not the other way around. Um, and and when we think about the candidate, we really need to think about the practice first and what it is, who the candidates are that we're trying to engage uh, before we start looking at the technology that's going to help us do it better. Um, and the two, in, the two together is really what we've been looking for more and more. So with that, with that said, um, let me tell you there are five areas that We've been spending a great deal of time trying to collect stories and data around five practices that I think are critical. Um, and I want to go through each one of those and then, and then move on from there. Um, the one thing I should be telling you, too, is next week, uh, it's a little bit of a coincidence, but next week in Nashville, uh, we're spending an entire day with case studies from companies throughout uh, the, throughout North America, uh, focused in on the practices that this year have the highest correlations uh, to the ratings that they got. And uh, more than 200 companies participated, and about 40 or 50 of those companies are being acknowledged next week as well, and so you might want to stay tuned for that. We'll be doing some more in Europe and in APAC uh, later in the year and early next year. So the five whose stories we really want to engage, um, let's take them one at a time. One is setting expectations and delivering on them. Um, when you think about <clears throat> walking into a restaurant, depending upon the type of restaurant that you walk into, um, you have a set of expectations about what you're going to see, how you're going to be treated, what's going to happen. When you walk into a store, uh, potentially to purchase something, you have a set of expectations. You expect <laughs> a price to be um, uh, very visible on every item of clothing or every object that's in that store, um, and especially if, if it's a kind of store in which that is where the expectation is. And I will tell you that your candidates have expectations about how they're going to be treated the moment they start becoming aware of you and start engaging you and start applying and start responding to your, cell, to your uh, phone screens and coming in for interviews, et cetera. Each stage of that process, they have embedded in themselves a set of expectations that may not have anything to do with what you actually do or promise. And if they don't, aren't aware of them, they're going to operate uh, of your expectations. They're going to operate on their own. And on that basis, uh, they will rate you very, very differently. Um, and you need to be able to think about that because most corporations have done a damn good job in the last decade in helping to set expectations about what the job would be like. But very few companies go out of their way to develop serious expectations about what they would find in this recruiting journey. And it's around that issue uh, that you should be looking at your practices, looking at how you set the stage when you're engaging candidates, um, et cetera. Those are serious issues in terms of how that candidate is going to see you in the long run. And so that's going to be very, very critical from that point of view. Um, second is the listing skills that you have. 
at some point, either in your engagement of that candidate, um, you need to be in a position to be able to respond to their questions, uh, to demonstrate that you can listen to them. Most companies fail miserably right at the beginning. They don't provide to prospects, typically, or to even those who apply, the ability to ask questions, either before they apply or immediately afterwards. And, and I'm, you can see the difference in how candidates will rate their overall experience based on their ability to have that kind of connection. Um, so if you're measuring it, you're finding extraordinary differences between companies that set up chat rooms, companies that offer information about their, uh, the profile of their, of their recruiters, and allow for potentially emails or texting back and forth. And depending upon the kind of corporation that you are and the kind of jobs that you're working on, um, I'm sure you can find uh, an appropriate messaging capability um, and organize it in a way that's not onerous to you, uh, that fits your culture, that fits your time, that fits your engagement. But listening skills and the ability to demonstrate that you've been actively listening is a critical issue. A third um, is, a, is an easy one. It's the extent to which your company holds you as a recruiter and your recruiting function accountable uh, for candidate experience as part of what you do. It's not the only thing by a long shot. You've got to be able to put those bodies in the seat. You've got to be able to satisfy hiring managers that you bring, you're bringing quality slates. And at the same time, you do have to satisfy candidates that you have a process that's out there, that you are setting expectations, that you are listening, et cetera. So if you're, not, if you're not actually accountable for it, then why would you actually care? Where's the motivation involved in that? What we measure is essentially what we're going to operate against. So your scorecard either is or is not including candidate experience. If it is, your ratings are higher than if it is. It's, it's as simple as that. And the more accountable, the higher the rating. Uh, closure, I'll leave uh, one of the most difficult ones for the, uh, for the last, but closure is probably the easiest of the five buckets. There is a critical component of being able to let every single person who uh, has applied, has exhibited interest in your company, um, some kind of closure. It can be as simple as an email. It should not be as simple as a default email from your ATS that says, you know, the position is closed, do not reply to this email. Um, you need to be able to, to uh, put together um, an appropriate way to respect the individuals who have given that time and energy to apply uh, but who did not go any further. And it's an essential component of being able to be rated well uh, by, by candidates. It's just um, unconscionable in my opinion, and I cannot imagine people viewing themselves as professionals who cannot develop some level of closure for every single person who has applied. Um, and that would be a key issue, but Surprisingly, surprisingly, um, of, the, of the companies that believe they're doing well, 80% um, of them believe that they are creating a closure with their candidates. Um, their candidates don't, don't always agree. <laughs> and so technology is an interesting tool that we, we need to deal with, not only in terms of helping us do what we want to do, but perhaps auditing that it's been done. Um, and that's a key issue, I think, from my perspective. And the only other thing I would mention about closure is that the longer you wait, um, the worse it gets for you in terms of your rating. So if the ex expected promise is that within a week of interviewing or two weeks of interviewing or eight weeks uh, after applying or whatever it is that you set as the standard by which you would be operating, um, or 
developing as a standard simply because you're, you're learning what your audience expects, the longer you wait, the lower the rating you will have in terms of the overall experience. So that's a key issue. And the, the fifth is a little bit more involved. I'll give you a very specific answer to that. Uh, the fifth is a perception of fairness on the part of the candidate. We get at that with a number of questions to the candidates, one of which is whether or not they believe that in their interaction with the company, whether it be simply through application or phone screen or interview um, or other uh, engagement with the, with the company, that they were able to share all of the things that they believed were important to share with that company um, in order to compete effectively. Um, surprisingly, that has one of the highest correlations. Uh, the answers to that have the highest correlations to the rating that the candidate's going to give you. And one, one way that I've seen companies, one practice I've seen companies alter to improve their uh, their ratings has been at the end of the application, the last question is what didn't we ask you about your skills, knowledge, and experience that you'd like to share with us now uh, so that you can compete for this job? And if that were also the last question asked in a phone screen, the last question asked in each interview, the last question um, asked at the end of an interview day might be, did the, in the interviews, did you, uh, were you asked those questions, did you have an opportunity to share, and if not, now's the time. If you want to compete fairly for this job, we need to know what you think is important. Those are critical, absolutely critical components, those five expectations, listening, accountability, fairness, and closure are the basic practices. Any other practice in any other bucket is going to be long tail. If you're not dealing with those five as the primary approaches to improving your candidate experience, you're missing the boat by a wide margin. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and fundamentally, it's the evidence that's telling us that. And I'll share more as we go into um, the hour. Um, but I want to turn it back uh, now and see what else we can talk about. Fantastic, Jerry. That was brilliant. I mean, you must have one of the biggest data sets that has been rigorously analyzed on this topic um, out there. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely believe that. Uh, I mean, that's why Apple has been so successful. Is you know, starting, you know, starting with a with a customer and and working backwards to the technology. I mean, I've heard that you know the MacBooks and a lot of their uh, the Apple kind of computers are designed to be taken a, apart. Jobs expected people to Mac users to want to take the Mac apart and put faster RAM, more memory in it, you know, so it's built to be opened up, you know, when, when you look inside it, it looks beautiful. Um, I, I've got a couple of uh, other questions that what you talked about throughout, but I'm going to hold them uh, till the end uh, because we've got, to, we've got to try and cover as much as we can in this hour. So I'd like to move to Noel now, uh, who's going to uh, talk about the consumerization of the candidate, uh, etc. So I'm just going to have to bring up Noel's slides. Give me, give me a sec. Right, no, can you see my slides okay? Or your slides? I can indeed, no, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the um, to this group today. Uh, I think Jerry's going to recognize some of the information on these slides because it is directly from the talent board. And uh, to your point, um, the team and that has been investigating this over the last few years has a huge data set. So expectations, listening, accountability, closure for the candidate, and fairness. Uh, so if you think about you know, what's changed, um, you know, candidate experience didn't start this Monday. It's been around for a long time, and lots of organizations are at different evolutions of their maturity. I would say you know, from a Thermo Fisher scientific perspective, 
we're on that road to improving. And uh, you know, specifically as an action this year, we entered uh, the Candy Awards, uh, not necessarily to, to, to win awards, uh, but to get the benchmark information, which is going to be critical to us getting even better at you know, those five areas. And I'll share today uh, what we are doing um, in those areas and um, our learning along the way. And I have a few slides and I uh, look forward to the questions and interaction then at the, at the end to hear um, uh, where you are on your specific journey. So uh, the consumerization of recruitment. So as we know, um, candidates and, and the macro landscape, unemployment is low, long time to hire, costs are going up. Um, candidates research us as their potential employer like they would buy a product. So look at up to 16 uh, sources before making a decision and including referrals. And uh, I think the, the days of posting, gathering applicants and making a hire are gone. Uh, we have limited active candidates in the market. Quality passive talent is hard to find. Uh, so our attraction focuses on making talent aware of us, uh, engaging with our brand and considering our jobs. But uh, much like consumer marketing, uh, the candidate behavior has become uh, consumerized also, and we need to build trust, keep them engaged, set the expectations, create loyalty through the through the experience. So, um, next slide, please, Scott. So I like this. You know, I think personalized and relevant communication, internal and external, along with constant engagement via channels where potential candidates are present, will increasingly be at the core of any recruitment efforts from now on. The only way to be prepared is to be agile today and assess and adapt accordingly. So quite like that, I think, um, you know, in most markets, millennials are uh, the majority demographic in, in organizations these days. They're digital natives and we need to communicate uh, using the platforms that they will um, most expect to be, uh, to be spoken to. Um, next, next slide. So I think we're, we're all aware of this. It's the candidate journey. So you know, from a Twitter, uh, from the Twitter account through to um, through YouTube, Glassdoor, um, looking at our website, reading employee testimonials, uh, blogs, etc., uh, and then getting to that final point of apply. And um, these aren't linear. They can go from one to the other and get us there eventually, hopefully. Uh, but we need to be ensuring right at the beginning of the, the candidate experience uh, that all of these touch points are uh, going to meet their expectations. So if we go to the, to the next slide. Thanks. So, so what are the expectations? So trust and transparency, a sense of connection with the brand, insight into the employee experience, and understand the culture. So the career site is still the most valuable channel, um, according to uh, the Candidate Experience Talent Board, 57% uh, of our candidates come by that channel. However, it is a declining trend over the past uh, three years. So what's next? We need to be aware. Candidates don't always trust the information like we don't as consumers. We look for alternative sources of, of truth. Um, and there's a rise in employer referrals. So again, ensuring that when we, we hire folks into the organization, that we're looking after them well and they're having a um, as a, a, an employee experience, enjoying their enjoying their career. Next slide, thanks. So, you know, what are those top issues issues for candidates? So, uh, as we said at the beginning, setting expectations. Uh, Sixty percent, sixty-six percent of candidates will wait for more than two weeks to hear back from the employer before considering the opportunity a lost cause and moving on to another. So if you think to a job at a point in your life, whether it was you know, just graduated or your first job in a, the local coffee shop, same, uh, same scenario, no matter what stage in your, in your uh, career search you're at, it's that lack of, um, um, lack of uh, closure for the candidates uh, that is a, is a major issue. A uh, timeline of recruiting process, so uh, candidates want to know um, what the clear outline of the recruiting process is. Um, candidates aren't willing to complete an application that takes 20 minutes. And I know we'll have a survey right at the end. Uh, the average time for a Fortune 500 company, uh, Fortune 500 company is 15 minutes. Uh, Netflix have got it down to one. Um, uh, I think 
you know, there's compliance regimes, et cetera, et cetera. It might be longer, but I think we'd all agree we want to get nearer to the, to the Netflix one-minute application and make it as simple and, and as easy for our candidates to, to get to us. 64% uh, of, of candidates will spend time researching before applying. And if they can't find the info they need on the company, half of the, or 37% of those people will move on to the next company or job listing. So it has to be available and it has to be out there and um, when we're, we're providing that information. So if we look at the candidate experience, it starts at attraction. So, you know, all of the, the pieces we already know about the power of your employee value proposition, your employer brand is, is key. Uh, what's often overlooked is that attracting candidates is critical to the overall process. So build a brand that is more authentic um, way and that builds that trust and connection. It gives job seekers their first impression of us and it's a strong consistent strategy then for attracting, engaging, <coughs> excuse me, and nurturing the, uh, the talent. So I think, you know, when we, we start to think about application drop-offs and, you know, see that, that number there, 74% uh, is the average drop-off drop during the application process because uh, they're not ready, they need more info, they um, and they need to understand more before they're willing to move their career to our organization. So uh, we measure this. Uh, our, I'll share our, our drop-off rate is 48%. And, you know, when we break that into uh, to hard numbers for us, um, that could be up to um, 400,000 candidates a year. And, and that is huge. And we know that 20% of those 400,000 are our customers, either current customers or future customers of our organization, uh, that is serious. And uh, that's why we are for, in, again in 2018, our, our core investment will be around candidate experience. It's our number one uh, priority next year. So we, we look at the number of apply clicks, the number of applications, the percentage completed, the percentage abandoned, and that helps us build that data that we, um, we use. And next slide, please. So I think we all know the answer to this. Do candidates talk about their experience? Uh, absolutely. And much like consumers, they share. 81% um, of the candidates share their positive recruiting experience with their inner circle, so their close network. And 66% 60 of their um, will share their negative experience. Uh, we've put a couple up there that are, are thermo Fisher specific. And you know, on the, on the positive side of the ledger, we had candidates that uh, said they thought it was a very fair process. The people were really nice and great to talk with. So, so that's great on Glassdoor. Uh, equally, we have a candidate uh, that uh, came for an interview and uh, you know felt uh, the interview process was not fair. And uh, they took to our corporate uh, Twitter account um, and you know made their feelings known. And we then had to manage that candidate directly and listen to them and understand where they were coming from. Uh, so we know it's out there and we need to be improving it on our side of the fence to ensure that when candidates uh, are talking about it, they have an authentic experience and they're, um, you know, they're sharing majority um, positive thoughts. Um, sorry, next, next slide, thanks. Uh, so, you know, the, the top issues for job seekers around candidate experience, I think Jerry's touched on these, so respect. Uh, experience the, the job description. So, you know, we've got a lot of um, improvements in that area around digital job descriptions and uh, making them as simple and engaging as possible. Um, stress level, I think that's, you know, 73% say the job search process is one of the most stressful things in life. Uh, we don't need to add to that. So let's, um, let's collectively try and build our candidate experience for our candidates. And then obviously mobile enabled is, is just taken as a baseline. Thanks, Scott. So I'm, I'm conscious I want to keep the, uh, from a time perspective, keep on going, but um, I thought we'd share um, a kind of a six stage um, checklist to, to, you know, to, to talk about at the end, but also to, to help uh, think about how you can transform your candidate experience. Uh, so the first being the, the, uh, the candidate journey map. So understanding, um, you know, each stage of the, uh, of that cycle of getting them um, towards our organization. So 
Uh, what we did is, you know, we looked at, um, we have a content worksheet that understands the type of questions that candidates would have at each stage. Uh, we've documented answers and mapped out how we need to improve that message across the different channels and communications. Uh, we're in the process of uh, finalizing with a, an AI tool to help us with some of that. Uh, then you look at your content strategy. So uh, we knew what our content gaps were, uh, where we needed to improve. Um, we looked for content owners to, to help us get some of the, you know, the great stories that we have across our organization and how that can get to the specific segments that we wanted to get the information to. Um, in terms of the 90-day plan, you know, what can you, um, you know, what can you cover in, in 90 days? So, you know, looking at your communications from uh, the ATS, that's, that's what we did as a starting point. Um, ensure that they're related to your brand. They're, uh, um, the employer brand um, document for hiring managers was created to help ensure that they are, you know, understanding how they, they, they share their stories and they share the, the organization. We looked at our career size. Um, we looked at employee advocacy and, and, and part of our social strategy. So that was the heart of what we were doing this year is uh, looking for authentic employee stories that we can put out there. And for us, LinkedIn Elevate helped us a lot. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Adrian Sullivan, will be um, at uh, presenting at Talent Connect on that a little bit uh, next week. So if any of you are going, you'll be able to get along and, and hear her speak. Uh, we implemented a CRM system this year to, again, help with that, um, that point of um, <coughs> communicating with candidates through their, through their journey. Um, in terms of the KPIs, uh, I think it's critical. I think it's you know, Jerry's point right at the beginning as well. If you're not measuring it, you, um, you're, you're stuffed before you get going because um, we need to understand at what points we can improve. And as I said, that's one of the reasons we, uh, we entered the, uh, the Candy Awards this year was to, just to get the information on how we can, uh, how we can do better. So uh, more information on that, which I'm, I'm very happy to um, uh, to share, and then in terms of a long-term strategy, um, ensuring that we are measuring it, so that can be um, it can be surveys, but it's creating that feedback loop um, that ensures that we are listening to what our candidates are saying, and we are holding the team accountable, and it's built into um, how they're rewarded, and it's built into our focus as a function. So into 2018, candidate experience will be our, our core investment. And it'll be what's driving um, uh, the function globally uh, as we go into the new year. So, um, you know, hopefully that's given you a little bit of food for thought. Um, and yeah, like as I said, I know we um, have some time for questions at the end and love to hear where you are on your journey. And um, hopefully that's been of some uh, use. Yeah, I think that was uh, brilliant. Very, uh, I mean, you can see it, you know, just how well planned and strategically thought out the um you know the direction that you're heading in at Thermos, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. You no know, the couple of things that struck me immediately was that um I mean absolutely candidates will look for alternative sources of truth. You know, they will that candidate journey is not linear. Uh, I mean we we often refer to it as the flight of the bumblebee because it just dots about. You know, no candidates are uh, created equal. You know they everyone's individuals and so they will they will look for references they will look for alternative sources of truth from a, from a whole raft of uh, of different channels and, and different areas uh, so they're talking around like a flight like a flight of the bumblebee also I mean 20 percent of 400,000 is 80,000 potential customers that dropped off in applications I mean that's good that's potentially a huge business impact and one of the things that uh, you know that I know from consumer branding is that you know us as individuals and as humans we build brands the same way that birds build nests you know we start with big sticks and then that provides the structure of the nest and then we pad it out with little sticks and other bits and pieces but those big sticks are most often word of mouth you know from people that you from people that you respect you know, and if you're if you're sharing that with your inner circle, if you've had a bad experience and you're sharing that with your inner with you know with your inner circle, your inner circle, that's a pretty big stick. Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely, in terms of what the candidates then go on to talk about from the inner circle. So I've got a ton of other questions, which I'm also going to hold to the end. But now I'm going to pass presenter to John. And uh, John, I'm going to share your screen now. OK, well, make a new presenter. And uh, John is going to uh, close off some of the open loops that have been raised now and, uh, and look at it from a kind of candidate attraction point of view uh, based on, on your experience. Over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, guys, and uh, thanks, Jerry and Noel. I'm um, really insightful. Um, I was scribbling away as you were both uh, both chatting, so uh, thank you. Um, well, I think what's really interesting is um, I feel like I'm actually on a sort of customer and marketing and brand webinar, and not a traditional, I guess, recruiting and candidate uh, webinar, which I think is is compelling in itself. Um, that even our language is changing. And I think what's also interesting, Noel shared the tweet, um, the angry tweet uh, <laughs> from, from the guy, and he, he explicitly calls his experience the customer service. Um, so what's really fascinating is he was a candidate, but he's, 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 he's interpreting the process and the journey from a consumer and a customer perspective, and he's even describing it that way. So I think what's happening is we've got to understand you know who our target audience is and I've started with this slide um, if you can all see it and this is us running a persona session here at Alpha um, where I guess we're kind of building on the mantra um, where Jerry started which was around understanding your customer first um, in our case it's candidates and actually it's not candidates to start with candidates are doing the transaction candidates are actively buying so they've, they've, they've explicitly said I want to apply for a job but as we now know from Jerry and Noel's um, sort of short, brief talks, is about these people are consuming you long before they're transacting with you. So in these persona sessions, we're trying to understand who they are, um, where they would likely engage digitally, and so online and offline. What type of content would they consume, and what sort of stories um, would they engage with? And if I just move to the next slide, um, so. <laughs> Uh, Scott talked about it's the, the flight of the bumblebee, I think it was, which is describing the, the candidate journey, that it's not linear. Um, but I think, and this is just an anecdote, but this is the storyboard um, for Star Wars, and I think it kind of demonstrates how characters, and if we use characters, the analogy of the candidate, how they can enter your narrative, into your content, into your, I guess, your brand streams. Um, and what you'll see is there are some candidates, or in this case characters, who are in your narrative the entire journey of the story. Um, and they're touching your brand in many different ways. They could be meeting up uh, at a candidate event. They could be meeting up at a sales event. They could be reading an article that you've posted. And I guess they're the heat maps in the narrative um, of, of the story arc. Um, but also what's really important is different characters come in at different stages. And I always kind of use the description of when we've been in an interview once um, and, and a hiring manager delivers the feedback and it says, oh, I just didn't think that candidate wanted it enough. Well, that's one of these characters in the storyboard who hasn't had the content and the context that they've needed to make an informed decision. And when they're coming to the interview, what they're trying to do is consume you. They're trying to learn and understand more about you as, a, as an organization. And it's because they came in the journey at a different stage. So if I move away from the, 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 the kind of storyboarding in the movie, I'm a Star Wars fan, so it always gets a mention. Um, and actually, we put this in the context of a recruiting and a talent attraction funnel. And we look at the different stages. And I guess this is the key point for me. If we look at the attraction and the engagement, and then we get to the transaction, in my, in what we're finding um, is actually the transaction is when they are a candidate. The attraction and the engagement is when they're a prospect or a lead, or they have a desire to show an interest, but they're not ready to buy yet. But what's really fascinating is if you can see what we do as an organization, um, and generally this happens, is we hit them in the attraction phase with what they're purchasing. So we provide them with a job description at the very beginning. And then we go through a CV application, and they're here they're looking for something else, but we're asking more of them. And when they're at the tr transaction, that's when they're a candidate. But if we look at how upside down this journey is from the candidate's perspective, and what we currently believe should be happening, is it the attraction there? They're looking for company insights. They're not looking for the product, the product being the job description. At the engagement layer, we ask them to apply. 
to basically elicit the engagement to purchase. And at that point, they want to find more about you. And then as we move down to the transaction layer, and this is the point where we are making a transaction, we interview you, you interview us. That's when they need their job description. So we're completely upside down, and, and, and it's interesting, this is the same in consumer world. And there was a, a survey that went out for um, marketers um, who had loyalty card schemes, and 63% of the marketers who had loyalty, loyalty card schemes believed that was a measure of how loyal the customer was. The same, <clears throat> the same survey went out to the, those, that, those customers who were on the loyalty card scheme, and that two-thirds of them were on the loyalty card scheme because they believed it was how loyal the brand was to them. So even in, even in customer and marketing, there's a complete disconnect between what we do as a company and what the customer wants. And this is happening in recruiting now. And we've learned about this through Jerry and Knowles with the level of engagement. So what really should this, this is what really happens. We try, the candidates try to get company insights, team insights, job descriptions at the point of interview, at the point of transaction. And that's not good enough. And that's not what they're asking for. So we have to shift everything further up the funnel, and this is really what it comes down to. Your attraction layer, you have to be telling your brand stories. You have to be telling the purpose. You have to be telling your real fellow proposition. You have to be sharing where you're located. What are your peer reviews? Because that's what the talent's looking for. The same as they move down the funnel. Here they want to understand who are your brand ambassadors, what's the employee successes, what's their story, not the recruiter's story, <laughs> and not your executive story. What is the team I'm going to be walking into, and what's their behavior? And here, that's exactly what the talent behavior are looking for. They're looking for team dynamics. What's their learnings? What's the culture? What's the career, career progression? What new skills am I going to learn? You can only tell that story by having your brand ambassadors tell it. That you cannot capture in a job description. But here, they get it, they're warming to the prospect of transacting with you. And now they want to buy. And here is where we deliver the job profile. Here is where we deliver the employee benefits, and that's the transaction. And that's what's missing in this candidate journey, and in fact, it's not the candidate journey, it's the prospect journey. They only become a candidate when they're transacting. And one of the things Jerry talked about was the technology. If you understand this first, you will never buy an ATS to start with, because your ATS is empty unless you've got pipeline or you've got candidates wanting to engage. Because the transaction layer is really what the ATS is. That's the applicant tracking system. It tracks when you've had a purchase, and it tracks them through the supply chain to onboard. What you have above that is your CMS and your CRMs, because that enables you to engage your audience. Okay, So I'll quickly move on, because I'm conscious of the time. What also happens is your team structure changes. So I've tried to kind of articulate this in, a, in a, I guess, a, a linear journey um, of what's needed. And if we look at the far right, you've got your visioning of your EVP, your, your employer value proposition and your branding, and then you're looking at your branding engagement and content delivery and community. Then you're moving to talent pipeline, so we're going right to left here, guys, and then talent coordination and talent selection of interviews. If you look at where your talent and brand engagement teams are, are operating, it's mostly in the talent pipelining, uh, sorry, from employer value proposition down to talent pipelining and talent pooling. Your hiring managers are actually involved in the talent selection, and that's not common. What actually is happening is we own the transaction layer, but that's not, shouldn't be our focus, in, in my opinion, and the data suggesting this, is that the hiring manager does the transaction. The interview. Yes, there's HR to train them, understand the complexities of an interview process, yada, yada, yada. But that's not our role. Our role is to drive the engagement and take the candidate or the prospecting candidates on a journey enough that gives them the right information for the candidates to make informed decisions whether they should purchase it or not. The same way as you have a, a bipolar reaction between who buys an iPhone and who buys an Android. It's the same journey. It's just different context and different content. So here's just an, uh, a kind of eight-month plan of where you can start looking at building your content plan. 
and understanding your customer journey, but it starts with understanding them, and then you can start to look at key assets that you can deliver. Okay, so looking at the brand ambassador engagement, um, building the content, whether it's blogs, whether it's social, um, whether it's um, white papers, whatever it might be, that comes in. You can then look at influencer programs, so who are your key influencers for your target audience? Is it somebody that's not currently employed with you? I mean, is it just a fan? If you think about what's happening on this webinar, um, you know, Scott's invited three people to come on board and tell their story. We have no affiliation to, to um, their business, right? Um, so, so think about how you can build influences into your plan that would attract people and that would tell the stories that you're currently uh, 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 kind of operating in in your business. And then your social media support, how do you engage them and distribute the content? And then, of course, we look at kind of landing pages because we have a different complexity here and a problem to solve that we're not public, we're a stealth organization. So we look at building landing pages where people can come on to and consume that content. Um, and that's just something that we put in. But that could, be, that could be your job profiling, that could be anything you want it to be. But the important thing is that you look at your reporting. You understand where people are coming into your journey. Um, and just to give you a bit of an idea, we've just run a recent campaign for five hires. We had to have 10,000 views on our digital campaigning to get enough profiles to come through where we could close those five vacancies. So think about the reach, think about the stories that are coming through the funnel, and think about the questions you're asking yourselves and the candidates and the prospects through the journey to help you shape the narrative and the content that you should be using. So I think that's the 10 minutes. I think that's up me up. I know it's a lot to take in, but they only gave me 10 minutes. Um, but I hope that's um, kind of got you thinking slightly differently and offered some insight. Hey, John, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, we, you know, our, our thinking, as you know, is very much aligned with yours. I mean, we, you know, when we, we absolutely concentrate on the, you know, the attraction and the engagement part of the, um, of the funnel or the pipeline, as we call it. And, you know, we know that, um, you know, what drives engagement is relevance and resonance. So, you know, if you think about an onions buyer, you know, which could be a software engineer who's, you know, French speaking but lives in London. If, uh, you know, if, you, if you're trying to sell onions to an onions bar, you talk to him about onions, you know, and you show him onions and you really, you show him really exotic onions, you know, banana shaped shallots, as somebody said to me yesterday. And, you know, that's easy to do when you can segment people into very, into different buyer personas and into very tight buckets, but it's much harder to do it based on, the stage that they are at in their journey, you know. So, are they at the attraction stage and and they're looking for company insights like you, like you showed, or are they at the engagement, you know, stage where they're looking for, you know, team insights and all that type of stuff? Um, because if you can understand what stage, you know, they're at in their journey, you know, i.e., where they are in the pipeline, then you can tell the story that's specific to that stage. And it's about getting the right content in front of the right contents, you know, to the right candidates at the right time, and that's what drives engagement. And until you can do that, you know, you know, I and, and we at Candidate ID, you know, firmly believe that if until you can do that, you're still net fishing. It's just post and pray, you know. And that's why we talk a lot about, you know, about spear fishing. But I'm gonna we're gonna move now to um uh to some polls. Okay. So um here's the first poll. So if everybody can jump across onto Slido and um just uh, start posting your responses on there. So, poll one is what is a candidate? Uh, and just select one. Is it everyone? A. Is it everyone who applies? B. Is it everyone who applies and is qualified? C. Or is it everybody who makes it to a screen, uh, phone, or interview? And, you know, I think John has, um, you know, has got a point of view on here about the difference between prospects and candidates and applicants. Uh, we certainly touched on that. But let's, um, Let's see how the numbers come in. I mean, maybe uh, Jerry, what do you want to do? You want to just as the numbers are coming in, do you want to you know provide a bit of narrative? Jerry, are you there? I was on mute. My apologies. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Here are the numbers coming in, Jerry. Go, go for it. Yeah, so the, um, the numbers are coming in, and I think it's a good example uh, of what happens if you were in a room of, uh, of recruiters and recruiting leaders who are focused 
in on looking at it from their perspective. And so uh, I think because of some of our conversation, we're, we're down to two, three answers. Typically, if I do this before anything else, uh, I'll, I'll end up with all four being uh, in some way, shape, or form identified by, by the folks in the room. And the, the point of this is around design thinking. Uh, the issue is to the well, to what extent can we get into the minds of the people that we're trying to engage and influence, and, and obviously the um, certainly with John and uh, and Noel looking at uh, who that customer is, who that candidate or potential candidate is, whether they're a lead, a prospect, uh, or have just become a candidate, um, understanding their point of view becomes increasingly important as we look at some of those issues related to marketing, which came up a, a lot uh, today. I don't, wanna, I don't want to diminish, however, that during that transaction phase, set of phases, there are um, plenty of practices and mistakes that are made that may not have as much impact uh, in terms of how vendors support them but in fact are critical uh, to the success, long-term success of the organization. Um, so they have to be put to bed. But this, this I think is great. You've got 62% saying everyone, and 31% saying everyone who applies, and 8% saying everyone who applies and is qualified. And it depends on a point of view. There are differences, but here's my point. My point is that if you ask candidates, all of them, 100% would answer the same way in response to when do you become a candidate. And it's the moment they express interest. It's the moment they press submit on the application or however that you've asked them to send that to you. The moment that somebody determines that they in fact are a candidate versus a prospect is a critical transition moment. And, and we as employers need to understand and to some degree define and engage people against their definition, not ours. Um, because it is their definition that changes the game for them. And so fundamentally, that's really critical points. So I, I agree with John, who is putting up that uh, funnel of looking at uh, the, the key areas in terms of the journey people are on before they've actually determined that they want to become a, a candidate. And, and as we move further, um, we need to look at each one separately and to some degree uh, deal with it and measure it. I think the other, the other piece that I would mention now um, uh, which relates to this is there are there are two issues that I think you have to make a decision on in your corporation. One is when do you define candidate, and what is it that you want to be able to do before that? And in terms of John's uh, presentation, there was a whole bunch of things. Same with Joel, uh, that we need to start thinking about differently. Um, the second is how are you going to measure this? And I increasingly uh, becoming more and more aligned with a, a simplified version to the measure of a uh, net promoter score. Uh, recently on my uh, website, Career Crossroads, I did in fact uh, rewrite and update an article um, on how we're measuring it for candidate experience. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, that an approach similar to that can be uh, adopted by almost any company in terms of being able to do that as a continuous process. And certainly there's a lot more companies out there that are willing to help corporations measure in an ongoing way uh, candidate experience, and that's a critical issue. Yeah, I think, um, if, if you don't mind, um I think I'll add um, add to what Jerry is saying. I, I know it's only language, but language drives the behavior in your organization, and importantly, it drives the behavior of your customer. Um, when, if we, the, 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 there's a talent marketplace, which actually includes your current employees, 
Um, there's a holistic view of the talent marketplace. Um, and, and, it's not, and, and that's what you're trying to uh, engage with. You're trying to, I guess, grab attention in various skill sets or pools or personas in that big talent marketplace to elicit a behavior for the, ta the individual talent to commit to being a candidate. And that, for me, is a very different, different behavior. That's about, it's actually, it's actually about making sure, it's actually about you do not own the talent anymore. It drives, it drives your organization to believe that they don't own the talent. And what you have to do is you have to grab attention to make them a candidate, to make the, ca to make the talent want to become a candidate to your organization. It's the same as a store trying to get footfall um, to come and purchase candy or whatever. Um, it, it's the same analogy. Um, we're still transacting with candidates, but we don't, we don't engage the talent marketplace. So that's just kind of adding my kind of opinion on, 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 on where we are with this. Cool. Uh, I, I would like to make uh, one, one particular comment about uh, Joel's presentation because I really uh, enjoyed um, hearing what he had to say. Um, for those who are listening who are considering getting more involved in candidate experience, I would uh, study his slides uh, because I think it's one of the best and most consistent blueprints uh, for how companies are shifting their thinking um, toward really looking at every stakeholder and fully engaging that in a process um, and and having interviewed hundreds of companies who are moving in that direction I can tell you that uh, those who are getting the highest ratings are doing much of what uh, Noel has talked about so I would really put that um, I would really focus on that Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, I've got a slight, um, I've got a slight network issue here in terms of the some of the audios coming coming and going. But we're going to go to let's go to the second poll, which is live now. Okay, so how long does it take your candidates to apply for a position? Select one. Okay, A's don't know. B is less than two minutes. C is between three and fifteen minutes, and D is more than fifteen between three and fifteen minutes. Uh, so, uh, no. Do you want to? Uh, I mean, you raised this in your um, in your presentation. Do you want to just chat about um, some of the stuff that you've learned here? Yeah. No. Thanks. Um, really, just to, for us to start to think about it because it is one of the clearly to the first poll around at what point do you become a candidate, um, you don't just become a candidate if you um, are abandoning that process. And as, as I said, you know, we, we're measuring that and that number of 20% of our, our candidates being customers, um, whilst it's, it's quite scary to actually to, to, to think about that, what it does is it becomes a very compelling conversation with your business leaders to say, we need to invest in this and whatever that investment might be around brand, around technology, uh, more people, uh, whatever, it, whatever um, that might be, that creates your business case. And um, I think looking at the results there between three and 15 minutes, 20% uh, have got it down below two minutes. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, and I, you know, I think that's the kind of where we want to get. We need to make it simple for, uh, for people to apply. Thank you also, this is Jerry. Uh, the evidence is, is currently showing that if you go beyond 15 minutes, the abandonment rate rises exponentially. And so <laughs> I don't know any other way to tell you that as you, as you go beyond 15 minutes, you may be able to set expectations, but beyond that, um, you are getting only a very small portion of the people that could be working for you. No, let's John. I'm just curious, what was the um, the time for the candidates to apply before you went on this journey? What, how long was it taking them? It was taking them about 15 minutes, so right at the cusp of, of too long. And 
and you know where our intention is to get us as near to that two minutes and we're looking at, at ways to help us do that but it was it was right at that 15 minutes um, you know particularly um, and, and that's as on average across all our roles what, what have you removed to get it down to two minutes we've removed some of the some of the questions we've removed some of the um, the data that we required because we can we can get it from other sources whether it's the CV um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so we were asking for them in some cases to duplicate information that we can get from another source um, I think they've helped us to uh, to improve that speed and we used a, a, the kind of uh, lean Six Sigma approach to um, uh, time and motion study of um, how long it takes uh, folks to apply and I think that's that's helped we are looking again to, to further in, improve that um, and we're looking as, as I mentioned with at an AI solution that uh, can help answer questions in real time which in in advance of them applying I think will help you know, so our abandonment rate might um, look at do you need a visa to work in this country if that's not asked right at the front you know, might be stating the obvious, but we had our um, our order incorrectly sequenced in some cases. Uh, you know, we don't want to waste people's time, so that that speeds up the process and makes it really clear back to kind of setting expectations. Okay, I'm going to move to the to the last poll because that you know is um, you know leads into something that's also very very topical at the moment is uh, around artificial intelligence. So, what stage? Are you at in thinking about leveraging AI tools to enhance your candidate experience? Select one. Okay, so what is AI? A, B, not implementing any solutions yet, but seriously considering. C, currently implementing uh, an AI related tool to support the candidate experience. And D, this is a robot answering AI is making a difference already, which we can measure. So again, this is probably if you want to if you want to kick off with this one um, with no. Yeah, really, just from my own interest, as we're we're certainly in um, in that um, B category, so we haven't implemented, but we are in the process of of, of uh, considering and um, you know keen to to see how others are thinking about that. And I, I know we're we're kind of pushing in terms of time, but uh, it's certainly a discussion. I'm 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 interested. So if, if anyone would like to. Um, uh, connect offline to, to talk about that, I'm, I'm very interested in it. And we're, we're seeing it as, like on our career side, having somebody there that can answer some of the questions or in terms of navigating, how do I get to content, uh, content who, who's the recruiter I can deal with, who's the, you know, the human being that I need to connect with for this particular rec, etc. I still think, uh, Noel, that um, uh, the evolution of those tools is obviously very rapid. Um, there's only, to my knowledge, you know, half a dozen to a dozen that are uh, that can operate at the level that you're talking about, um, and and they're improving daily. So, part of it is the willingness, I think, to uh, test uh, new ideas and new products that are um, obviously making their way into our lexicon, but um, are still proving themselves uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and I think there's different forms of AI as well. I think, I think Jerry's right. We're, we're on the exponential curve of AI, and, and the experimentation is going to... And it's the use case, right? I mean, as Noel starts working with it, and, and we start to prove where it happens, then, then I do think it, it adds the value. Um, but I think I think AI will play a role, I and mean, we've we've been prototyping around the sourcing element with AI. Here, I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by machine learners and, and AI researchers here. Um, but also understanding your customer um, and the candidate, and driving content that's appropriate for their stage in the funnel um, is something we're exploring. Um, I don't know whether that's that's going to be solved right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's um, it's exciting. It's good to see 80% are considering it on the on the polls. By the way, that's really cool. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I think we're um, so. I mean, what you can see there is that uh, you know 80% of the poll are, um, even though the numbers are relatively small, are you know 
considering it, uh, not deployed anything yet, but definitely considering it. So, you know, we're we're a little bit over time, but there's still um, the majority of everybody staying on. So I think, well, let's try and do two questions and um, people can vote on questions uh, on Slido. But there's a great one here. I mean, the first two are really kind of very similar. Um, you know, this kind of closure and personalization and dealing with candidates as individuals and one-to-one and -one is, brilliant as an idea but you know how on earth can you do it at scale uh, to Jerry first well I think first of all you can I mean the issue is who's involved um, and most companies do not uh, you know do not for example provide access to, to to recruiters large companies have large numbers of recruiters and yet those recruiters are hidden behind a screen in most instances there are examples of some companies who publish their own profiles of all their recruiters and provide access to them from the perspective of who's who's dealing with them. Most most recruiters, you know, hear that and they go, "Oh my God, no! I wouldn't be doing that." Um, so the alternative that's used by many companies is, I think, uh, in, is providing an a, a given time frame uh, each week or or in some regular basis. To, uh, to have a chat room and just basically say, bring your questions. Um, a a uh, small but growing company um, uh, out in Silicon Valley uh, basically runs a, a, a chat room every single day and says, if you bring honest questions, we have honest answers. And I, I state that simply because if you're going to open up the the dialogue between yourself and a pool of candidates, whether it be on some systematic uh, basis or not, you need to know uh, what you're authorized to be able to share. Um, we talk transparency, but to be honest with you, most corporations have yet to get to the level of transparency that the candidates fully expect. Um, so you need to be able to ask internally and understand how well empowered you are to answer the questions that are obviously not being answered uh, through your career site. Full transparency is just not there yet. And, and most corporations are unwilling to tell hiring managers who suck that we're not going to hire for you anymore. <laughs> um, and, and so until we start sharing uh, perhaps a, um, a crowdsourced view of who is good at developing candidate, uh, developing new employees and who isn't, uh, we're still going to be stuck into, um, in, into a whole different approach to how we deal with transparency. I like that idea. It's glass door for managers. Yeah, I know. It's a whole, that's a whole different conversation, but um, I can. I've. I have made and continue to make lists of 20, 30 things that recruiters do not share that candidates want, and we wouldn't be doing that from a consumer point of view. Um, we would understand from a consumer point of view that the price of a, a of a, of an article needs to be very visible. And I have to tell you, there's very few companies that I know of who are sharing their approach to compensation in advance of um, asking the, the candidate, uh, you know, what their expectations are. I, I mean, I think this is, I mean, these two first questions are such a, you know, huge topic in themselves because the minute that you have, uh, you know, a candidate who's made significant effort either in, you know, applying okay and has invested themselves emotionally in, in, in trying to move forward with this organization then you know candidate experience becomes critical and you know communication needs to be better and feedback and all this type of thing so but given that it's so easy and it's getting easier and easier and easier to find jobs that are you know vacancies that are available and it's easier and easier to apply so I would guess that the number of applications is going up which means that the number of personalized responses is growing all the time, which is which is just a kind of growing, growing issue uh, on on both sides. And so it's a you know is a is a kind of a, a better you know maybe a better solution is how do you 
how do you, you kind of maybe filter candidates out before they get to that transaction stage? So let me let me just tell you what the answer is. The answer is giving candidates enough information so that they can make a better decision. The yeah. failure of recruiting in the 21st century is that we're still only talking about what the employer does rather than providing the candidates with an experience, not that makes them happy, but a, an experience that allows them to better understand the decisions in front of them, the quality of the hiring manager, the, the collaboration skills of the team, so that the candidate can measure and obviously I'm talking about a great candidate, can measure uh, the extent to which the company's culture matches their interests rather than uh, them constantly submitting to the decision and selection of the employer. And the best, can the best candidates in the world are candidates who have taken back uh, that decision process and they're frustrated because they failed to get the information easily. They can certainly get it because now they have connections inside the company that they are in fact calling and saying, tell me more about the approach to decision making in your company before I even apply. We could do a much better job um, if we wanted to in, in providing the kind of information that allows personalized decisions. But we've really failed uh, to want to do that uh, for fear of upsetting uh, some of the, the PR stuff that still exists in our organization. So we talk about a company being family friendly, uh, but there are jobs within every company that are just not family friendly, and we should be telling them that. Just saying. No, amen no, no, no. To that. You go, John. No, I was just saying amen to that. I think, I, I think the candidate, the talent, the candidate, call it what you will, uh, the, the data is suggesting that they're longing for that information. Um, they're trying to consume you to find that stuff out so they can make informed choices. Just the same as you do consume product every day. Um, it's almost a bit unfair that we don't do that. Um, I'm with Jerry. Um, I think we should be t painting an honest picture. And that comes back to your employer value proposition. You know, if you are a stuffy nosed accountancy, <laughs> if I can use that description, apologies for any of those that are on the phone, um, then that's what you should tell. Um, I, you know, it, it's just the realities of, of it's the truth, um, plain and simple. And then that, to me, that scales. So that, that means there's some self-selection going on. Yeah. And, and the people who come through that filter are people that you want to spend, you, you have the time to spend now with them. Obviously, there are technology tools that Noel was talking about in terms of um, machine learning AI that's going to save, I think, recruiters much more time over the next year to two years. And as they gain that time back, it will be spent on, on the, the engagement process with both prospects and candidates in ways that I think add real value. Noel, you've got, have you got anything final that you want to add? I mean, we're not, I mean, we're like 14 minutes over. We've got a ton of questions, and uh, so we're not going to take any more. We're just going to close on this one. Yeah, no, I think the guys is right on it. I think as it's back to being authentic, and, um, you know, that is how you'll um, engage with the talent through that process, and I think that's part of the challenge with the corporate career sites and why you're seeing that three-year decline trend, it's still the number one channel today, but uh, people go for that alternative source of truth, which is actually, you know, the fancy pictures and it looks great and is that the case and, you know, what is the evidence against that and they'll make a decision based on that. Yeah, look, I think there's, I mean, there's so much in this topic and there's so much that we haven't really covered that um, I think that what would be a great thing to consider doing would be to circle back on this in, in six months and, you know, see what's changed, maybe six or nine months or something like that. But we will certainly, um, you know, we will share the on-demand uh, version of the webinar with everybody that signed up to attend. Anybody who's got some burning questions that um, still have not been answered, then just email them to me directly and, and um, you, know, you know, we can field them or, or point you in the right direction. But I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to Jerry, Noel and John for 
taking time out of their busy schedules um, and to join us today for a, what was a fascinating uh, Talent Talk on Candidate experience. Thanks very much, guys, and enjoy your Thursday. Yes, all. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.